Well, welcome everyone to the 12th meeting in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone present is pleased reminded to switch off their mobile phones. Apologies have been received from Gail Ross, the Deputy Convener. Uh, there are no other apologies. The first item today is to seek the agreement of the committee to consider the evidence it has heard on the forthcoming draft budget 2017-18 at agenda item five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, at agenda item two, the committee is going to take evidence on the Scottish Government's forthcoming draft budget 2017-18. Today we're focusing on broadband and I would like to welcome Stuart McKinnon, Senior Public Affairs Advisor to the Federation of Small Businesses. Stuart Robertson, Digital, sorry, Director of Digital Highlands and Islands, Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Zoe Laird, Community Broadband Scotland, Director, Community Broadband Scotland. Uh, Glenn Preston, Director of Ofcom Scotland. And Professor Michael Foreman, of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I would like to welcome you all to the meeting, and can I ask each of you if you'd very briefly give an outline of the respective organisations that you represent? And Stuart, if we could start with you, we'll work directly along the table. No, <clears throat> no problem, my name's Stuart McKinnon, I work for the, the Federation of Small Business in Scotland. The FSB is a business membership organisation with approximately 18,000 uh, members in Scotland and about 170,000 members across the UK. We campaign for a business environment that helps small businesses thrive. Thank you. Stuart. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Stuart Robertson, um, representing Highlands and Islands Enterprise. We're obviously an economic development and community development agency for the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. And we've been very closely involved in... Um, all things digital, including the rollout of superfast broadband to date. Sorry. I'm Zoe Laird. I'm the Director of Community Broadband Scotland, which um, is under the governance of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and operates across the whole of Scotland to work with communities to develop uh, solutions to broadband infrastructure. Glenn. Uh, good morning, Glenn Preston. I'm the Scotland Director for Ofcom. Um, we are the communications sector regulator, um, focusing specifically on fixed and mobile telecoms, uh, on broadband uh, and broadcasting, as well as some post issues. Um, I should add that we are about to assume regulatory responsibilities of the BBC from April of next year, as you know, but fortunately that's not the topic of conversation today. Um, Michael. I'm Michael Foreman. I'm a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I chaired uh, a Digital Scotland committee that produced two reports, one in 2010, one in 2015. I'm also a professor at the University of Edinburgh with a continued interest in these matters. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd just like to remind uh, witnesses, we are, we are particularly looking at uh, the, the, f the financial aspects of, of the rollout programme. But the questions that you will receive this morning are quite wide-ranging, which will help inform us. But if you can always remember, the, if there's an opportunity to illustrate it with costs to inform our decisions, that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, the first question is from Stuart. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. And, and it's a question that I, I expect all may wish to contribute to. Um, on the 3rd of November, the Scottish Government uh, launched a consultation, a digital strategy for Scotland 2017 uh, and beyond. Now, it may well be, of course, that responses will be coming from a number uh, of people on the panel, but it would be helpful if uh, we had an indication of the sort of things that uh, perhaps the FSB and the Royal Society in particular uh, might wish to see reflected in the strategy, and perhaps Ofcom as well. So, Stuart, would you like to lead on that? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, FSB is still formulating a response to the to the new digital strategy. Broadly, we're going to say that um, some good progress has been made, but we're far from being a world leading digital nation. Um, we need a program of works across multiple fronts to to try and close the gra gap between Scotland um, and other leading digital nations. I would say, obviously, infrastructure. Um, the, we're, we're pleased with the Scottish Government commitment to, to universal superfast broadband. We need to see progress across mobile as well. Um, we need um, extra effort to, um, to boost skills 
and also to deliver extensive business support. We're also um, looking for progress um, across digital government as well, where I think that Scotland uh, lags other parts of the UK. Okay, Professor, do you want to add to that? Briefly, yes. I, firstly, I think more ambitious targets, more investment and more open access, particularly where there's natural monopoly, as is the case in much of rural Scotland. On the, on the skills issue, we feel, I think this is a common feeling amongst much of the fellowship, that digital needs to be embedded in the curriculum throughout uh, all stages of learning alongside literacy and numeracy. Uh, and on exclusion, uh, work I've done recently looking at Ofcom data, for which I'm very grateful, shows that although we're making huge progress in connectivity, those who remain offline are increasingly deprived with respect to those who are online, and that's actually serving to put them in a place where it's very hard for them to get out of the situation they're in because they don't have the digital benefits, and they can't even get the digital benefits because of the situation they're in, so you get a cycle of deprivation. Stuart, do you want to comment from a Highlands just, and Islands perspective? Uh, just really to say that we, we um, are responding to um, particularly uh, well, connectivity. We're involved in discussions about what, what comes next. Um, on the economy, skills, participation and security, we, we, will, uh, we have already uh, given some informal um, feedback to the Scottish Government. So um, um, we think these themes are the, the correct themes and, and we will certainly be involved in, in all parts of the um, formation of the strategy. Okay. So uh, rural areas were mentioned. I'm sure you'll have a view there. Yeah, well, obviously, connectivity is such a key part. Um, from, from my point of view, the more people using uh, broadband, the, the better economic and social impacts we have, just as Michael mentioned. Um, so it would be to look at a focus on that, but obviously connectivity has to come to enable some of that to happen. Glenn, do you want to add something on that? Uh, if, I, if I may, please. Um, I think that we're, we're making a decision just now about whether we want to, to feed in formally to the consultation and different parts of Ofcom are, are considering the, the key aspects, the key themes that have been identified uh, in the new digital strategy. Probably the critical issue for us um, is the question of the relationship between the UK government's proposal for a broadband USO uh, and the Scottish government's uh, own commitment to 100% supervast by 2021. Um, the committee is probably aware that we are already providing technical advice to the UK government by the end of the year uh, on the range of options that are avail available to them to deliver their commitment to the broadband USO. Uh, and the question for us is how that might overlap uh, with the Scottish Government's own plans uh, for 100% superfast. Um, we are encouraging dialogue between both of the administrations to understand how they want to achieve these things, uh, what their timelines and implementation plans are, uh, and what technical advice Ofcom as a, as a regulator can offer to both administrations uh, to allow them to achieve their objectives. Stuart. Um, obviously, we're thinking of budgets here, so I want to go on and talk about uh, what funding might be required but just as part of answering that and on the back of what's come up perhaps particularly from Ofcom uh, where uh, we were hearing their involvement with the two governments and I just wondered if Ofcom had yet got a view on the prospects that 5G might have for delivering super vast broadband uh, speeds to areas that might otherwise be very expensive or difficult to reach, and in particular whether consideration is being given to what has happened in Germany, where the new technologies are focused on filling the areas that have currently zero G, in other words, no coverage, uh, preferentially before upgrading the services of the already digitally rich areas in the centre of our, our cities. And uh, just to uh, complete this round for Professor, I just wanted to uh, briefly, uh, a reference was made in your opening remarks to open access, and I just wanted greater clarity as to what you meant when you said that. I was a little uncertain about that. Okay, I, th I think just because there's some quite meaty bits in there, and, and, and perhaps if we could get the, uh, I could ask Glenn just to comment on on, on the 5G point that, that Stuart's raised, and then the professor, and then I'm going to come to each of you and ask you on the funding and where you think we need to be as far as funding to achieve the, the government's uh, uh, 
ambitions. So, Glenn, could you start, please? Um, yes, absolutely. And I, I am happy to, to respond on the funding point as well, because it is a feature of the conversation. Um, the chance, if you could you. do with the 5G first, that yeah, would be perfect. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the short answer uh, to Mr. Stevenson's question is, um, we don't, we don't yet know um, what um, 5G is going to, to mean in terms of the availability of um, superfast, um, but it is absolutely uh, one of the things that we're going to be consulting on uh, and considering over the course of the next few months. Uh, we are talking about, I think, years, frankly, um, before there are um, you know, clear, clear solutions as to the provision of 5B, B's links with, uh, with superfast. Um, but we are confident that it should it should provide that, and our expectation is that it should provide that type of basis uh, for the provision of supervast, so improved latency and bandwidths and so on. Um, and uh, we, we will consult openly on this over the course of the next probably 12 to 18 months, uh, and I'm looking to engage with both the Scottish Government, UK Government and this committee uh, on, on how uh, this, can, this can deliver the sort of objectives that both of the administrations want. Briefly ask if you're also engaged in the issue of early delivery to areas without coverage? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, when we consult, I think one of the things we will do is look at that German model that you mentioned, the kind of inside out rural model where you know, the, that obligation was placed on the providers uh, to consider uh, making the provision in, in rural areas come first before they go to those urban areas. So that, that is absolutely one of the options that we'll be looking to, to get views on. So no G will go straight from no G to 5G, is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we're suggesting that at all. Um, but, we do, but we do think that, uh, that, that 5G potentially offers us a significant um, step towards uh, the super vast speeds that, that both governments are looking for. Before we leave 5G, I think Jamie's got a question on that for you, Glenn. Just very brief on that. Uh, is this going to come about via an auction of Spectrum? In other words, is Ofcom holding a... Uh, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, still recovering. Uh, a spectrum of the frequencies required to deliver 5G, and if so, uh, how far down that process of uh, the parameters of the auction in terms of um, you know bids, uh, you know who can bid for it, um, how much they can bid for, etc. So. Yeah, the short, the short answer to the question is yes. Um, these, this will feature as part of the spectrum auctions that, that Ofcom will bring forward over the course of the next uh, few months and couple of years. Um, we did bring forward um, a consultation on 2.3 megahertz last uh, gigahertz last week, uh, and we've been quite clear about um, those people who are entitled to bid for certain elements of that spectrum. Um, the, the process of clearance of 700 megahertz, which is one of those areas where we think there is the kind of most scope to get deeper into buildings, for example, uh, is uh, some time away still, um, and we'll be looking to consult on that probably in the next 12 to 18 months or so. Professor, I think there was a... Stuart had asked you a specific question on openness, I think. I think... Open access. The, yes, the way I would respond to that is to say we've made tremendous progress in the Highlands and Islands with the fibre that's been put in that actually changes the game for, for Western Scotland. But those publicly funded assets aren't being managed, in my opinion, and plenty of colleagues' opinions, to encourage competition and maximise the benefits. And I think that that's largely a regulatory issue in the UK because the commercial... Um, well, those now belong to BT, so they're publicly funded, they belong to BT, and there's uh, no way that BT as a commercial decision would decide to open them up to competition in a way that might maximise those benefits. Very, very briefly, you're, you're suggesting that we should get to a position where the signals on the fibre can be created and managed by other than simply open reach. In other words, there should be multiple carriers directly interfacing with the cable. In many community projects, they found that despite the fact that there is now fibre nearby, they can't access that fibre cost-effectively, and I think that's slowing down progress. Thank you. OK, <clears throat> uh, now finances, and, and how much is it going to cost us, Stuart? <laughs> You know, the FSB accepts that, that progress has been made to improve uh, Scotland's broadband capabilities, um, but it's difficult to tally that with the experience we get back from our members um, on a day-to-day -and -day and week-to-week basis. I'm, I'm sure, like like MSPs' mailbags, uh, you know, we we regularly get contact from 
uh, from businesses who are dissatisfied with their with their connectivity. Um, we're looking for you know sustained uh, sustained funding to to, to improve uh, to improve Scotland's connectivity on and on a, on a UK wide basis. FSB has been pushing for improved local infrastructure, specifically roads, broadband, and and. and suggested that any monies coming to Scotland from the autumn statement could be deployed um, to improve local infrastructure and specifically uh, digital infrastructure. One of the interesting elements of the autumn statement was a, a new proposed uh, rate relief for digital infrastructure. Um, there's a precedent for that in Scotland with the rate relief on, on mobile masts. Um, could, that be, could that be deployed in, in Scotland? Um, you know, without without the resources of uh, government at, at my disposal, I can't say how much um, bringing Scotland up to speed would would cost. But you know, we, we can look at the the current four hundred pound four hundred million pound program to to improve digital infrastructure uh, and, and broadband infrastructure in Scotland, and we can maybe compare that to the co the cost of the new of the new fourth bridge at one point four billion. And, and we can say, you know, while the, the new bridge is important, we need to see digital infrastructure in the same light as we do physical infrastructure. So, sorry, just so I can, I, I can understand that. Do, you're saying the 400 million, are you saying that's not enough? Are you saying... The... I, I, if we're going to achieve 100% coverage, I, I think it's, it's well recognised that that's, that's not enough money. Just check, of course, the 400 million is merely the government investment. Yes. There are commercially viable areas. I think the, the 400 that are also receiving investment directly from commercial providers. Um, you're from from my, my 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 information suggests that the 400 million is a combination of Scottish government, UK government, yeah. European money, and I'm, local government money plus a little bit of investment I'm, from BT. No, I'm 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 just checking. I I just choose this as a random example. Sure. Um, the area around Turriff is yep. not included in the area that's supported by government yes. because it's expected that it will be commercially viable and therefore the investment to make it accessible uh, is coming solely from BT Openreach who own. Yep. And I'm just wondering, I don't know what the number for that is, so I'm merely suggesting that it may be a bigger number. I don't know what it is. Do sure. You? To, 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 to clarify, I, I would say that there will be in the additional uh, investment needed for um, um, interventions in the yep. marketplace in That's places right. that the market won't service. Stuart, I feel confident you're going to have, have, have a figure to hand. Um, well, I certainly uh, try and come up with a figure. Um, I think the first thing we have to remember is that uh, what we've, we've done today is try and address a, a market failure where the um, private sector has gone so far and then we're, we're putting public money in to, to go further. And um, I'm certainly going on the basis that as we get to 100%, that will be uh, almost like a market failure on top of a market failure. So it will be a very high proportion of that will be public intervention. And the public intervention to date is quite different from the rest of Scotland and Highlands and Islands. The public intervention in the Highlands and Islands is somewhere around, has been around 95% public uh, intervention. And uh, I can only think that that kind of level of intervention will continue. So the 410 million that's been uh, earmarked to date does indeed include contribution from the, the winning bidder. Um, uh, what I suppose I'm saying is going forwards, I am, um, I can't see that there will be a, a, a large contribution from the private sector. I think we need to rely on a, a very large proportion of that being public money. Um, Highlands and Islands Enterprise has not uh, done any analysis or, or got any analysis of the, of the budget this time round because we're not in the lead as last time, but uh, in uh, for or our own region. Last time, though, we got independent uh, consultants to look at it, and the, the estimate was to get to the then target, which was 90% coverage in the Highlands and Islands, it would take between 200 and 300 million to reach that level. As, as members will know, we uh, have a budget of 146 million, and we're getting to around about, by the end of next year, around about 86% coverage. So. I think going forwards, um, I think it's probably reasonable to think that we may well still need 200 to 300 million, given that 
we are now going to uh, seeking to get to 100% as opposed to 90%, and that we need to get everybody to, um, unlike uh, the target last time, to connect people to the infrastructure, the target this time is actually super fast speeds for everyone. So um, I think uh, I won't make any uh, guesses about what the rest of Scotland would take, but I would point out that back in 2004, when we were investing in ADSL first generation broadband, that at the end of the day, the public intervention for the Highlands and Islands was on par with the public intervention for the rest of Scotland. So it's, in, in a way, it would appear that it's the landmass you've got to cover that's going to um, indicate the cost rather than necessarily the number of premises or people that you have to cover. And, and sorry, just so I understand, that that, that, that is including the, the most expensive last 2 or 3% that you think will, will be difficult on fibre, or is that using other means as well? I think uh, we certainly believe that we, we have to recognise that there may be a number of different solutions to get to the 100%. I think that uh, if we were trying to get fibre to everybody, we would have a much, much greater um, cost. Zoe, you, you, you've experienced that. <laughs> yeah, um, I think Stuart's right to aim for possibly the ultimate solution of full fibre is considerably expensive, but probably should be considered over a longer term than our 2020 target. Um, mm. And I think it would be possible to get an estimate of what that might cost from uh, some of the officials who've been doing some modelling work. I think there's also experience from other countries to draw from. And from what I've seen, other countries tend to, have tended to spend more uh, to achieve more than, than we have in, in Scotland historically. So I think there's a few possibilities for getting a ballpark figure for the ultimate goal. But um, one of the points I wanted to raise was in relation to something that Michael Foreman mentioned earlier, when we're working with communities right at the edge of connectivity, the wholesale backhaul costs uh, can be prohibitive. And what that does tend to mean is that small projects find it very difficult in terms of economies of scale to cover their annual costs. So what I would refer to as operating expenditure on an annual basis can be extremely challenging as we go ahead. And we may need to find ways to support that uh, going ahead in the future. I think ultimately that should be negated by a much longer roll out of fibre and improve backhaul across the country. But there's a stepping stone before we get to that point. So it doesn't necessarily answer your question with a number, but it gives you some clues. But it gives us an indication it's an ongoing problem yeah. once, once connections made. Glenn, sorry. Um, yeah, so from an Ofcom perspective, I think we would recognise um, the points that both Zoe and, and Stuart have made. Our, our approach um, is, I guess, slightly different uh, in the sense that we've been tasked with providing technical advice to the UK government on their broadband USO proposals, uh, and that includes a strand of work looking at costs and technologies, and I think we recognise that for some of those remote and rural areas, uh, as Zoe said, that, that, that and, and, and Stuart said, that kind of mix of technologies um, will be essential uh, to deliver the objectives that the governments are seeking. Um, in terms of the work that we're doing on the broadband USO, uh, we consulted on it in the summer um, and we ended up with a couple of distinct visions of how to achieve the objectives of a broadband USO. Um, so there was the what we would describe as the kind of safety net, giving access to key online services, um, which is the, the kind of 10 megabit uh, that the UK government's talking about. Um, and then a service similar to that provided in commercially competitive areas. So you can see where they, they kind of feature on the on the spectrum, where you'd have a, a minimum download speed, um, you know, maybe up to, to 30 megabit, which is, uh, I think, what the Scottish government has, has committed to as well. Um, and our job over the course of the next uh, three or four weeks is to, to look at all the data that we uh, gathered uh, during the consultation um, and to finalise that in advice to the UK government um, on what those costs and technologies might, might look like. So we haven't, we haven't got a final figure yet, and that's for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, I'm not clear yet if it's going to be disaggregated for different bits of the United Kingdom, but can check that and certainly come back to the, come back to the committee. Um, but we have also committed to having a conversation uh, with the Scottish Government about um, you know, how we can support with, uh, with our own um, technical advice and consideration their own commitment um, to do super fast by 2021. We've constantly heard the use of download speeds. Mm. 
we're also looking at improving upload speeds yeah. Yeah. to sub speeds similar to the download speed. Yeah. Right. Thank that you. Will, uh, I mean, that's the sort of thing that will absolutely feature in the because, consideration. Because that we for have many to give, yeah. rural industries in design and so on, upload is very important as well yeah. as download. Thank you. Sorry, just to be clear, when do you think that piece of work will be finished? Because you offered to offered it to come back to the committee and let us know that. Yeah, we're, so so the end of the calendar year is the deadline that we have um, from the UK government. So I think it will be in the kind of last week before Christmas is when we expect to, to share that with them. So when would you be in a position to share that with with others? We'll try and do that as quick, quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and I'll make a commitment to the committee today to come back to you and give you a kind of specific a specific date to share what we can. That would be perfect. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you want to...? Yes, if I may. I'm not a financial expert, but I can look around the world. So, like Zoe, I think looking at other places is worthwhile. So, our targets are set at 24 or 30 megabits a second, and that's called next generation. There's a recognised problem of long lines, but it's not quantified very well, so when we give our targets for coverage, it's not always clear whether we're including the long lines where you won't get those speeds or not. Um, we're a small country, 18% your rural population. Let's compare us with, and we've spent about half a billion so far. So France, eight times the area, 10 times the population, has recently committed 20 billion of my euros. This is of government money, is my understanding. Uh, they have 24% rural population, ten times, uh, eight times the area, ten times the population. So we're under-investing compared with France, and their target is 100% to 100 megabits per second for 2022. Maybe France is too big, so think of Estonia. Estonia, 31% of the population is rural. They're half the area we have, and only a quarter of the population we have, but their target is... 98% within 1.5 kilometers of fiber access. And as long as we do the kind of technologies we're using at the moment, you will not have download speeds and match, upload speeds matching each other because the, the technology for the last connectivity is that you share the upload effectively between a number of people, even though you're getting better on the download. So th there really are problems with the whole strategy. And my feeling is that you should up both the funding and the targets in order to compete with the rest of the world. And those are just two examples. You can find many more. Okay. Uh, I think the next question is, is coming from, from Mike. My question is in two parts. Um, Fergus Ewing, our Cabinet Secretary, whose responsibility is this, has reaffirmed this month that uh, on the 3rd of November, he said that 95% of households should be um, connected to superfast broadband by the end of next year. That's just 13 months from today, 13 months' time. So my question really is, um, firstly, do you think that target is going to be achieved in 13 months' time? And secondly, since we're focusing on the budget and we're looking at the budget that's about to be presented to us, do you think there's enough money in, that is Scottish Government money, in the programmes to, to, to ensure that we hit the, that target. So really, um, um, is, it, is it going to be a hit? If we don't think it's going to be a hit, is, is it primarily funding or is there something else? And have we got enough money in the budget? Um, difficult question. Who, who would like to go first on that? You're all looking the other way. Uh, uh, Stuart Robertson. <laughs> I, I think that the 95% the, the target, given that it's based on connecting premises to the upgraded infrastructure is doable by 2017. We're already seeing that, as, you, as members will know, the Highlands and Islands project is running slightly ahead of the rest of Scotland in that we were due to complete the first phase by the end of this calendar year, but um, we're seeing additional rollout going to happen through next year. So we're going to go further than the 84% that we originally thought. And that may well be the case, uh, well, it's already the case in the rest of Scotland that they have gain share or clawback money to enable to go further. So I think on the basis that the target was set, which was the percentage of premises connected to the new infrastructure, not premises at, 90, uh, at 24 meg or above, I think that target is, 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 is doable. And I think there is enough money currently. I think the challenge is to, is to go beyond the 95% 
uh, um, well, two things. One is to bring everybody within the 95% up to super fast speeds um, and then go beyond the 95% to, to get super fast speeds to the last 5%. I noticed a wry smile from, from uh, Michael. I wonder if you'd like to come back at that stage. It's merely this connected to super fast. Frankly, the moment you're connected to the internet, you're connected to super fast somewhere. It, being connected to super fast really doesn't do you any good if you're just getting super slow speeds. So it, it's a target that I think shouldn't be publicized because it sets expectations, because people naturally think I'm connected to super fast, I should get super fast speeds. It's, I think the Advertising Standards Authority should get in here. Not, you know, this, this just doesn't tell the truth to the public. I give everyone else, Stuart, do you want to come? It's a tiny semantic point, but there is something important behind it. Um, I heard Stuart Robertson say 95% people connected to superfast broadband. Is it not the case it's 95% of people connectable? Because being connected requires you to sign up and pay money. Yes, sorry, I just wanted I, to be clear. I, 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 you are in, in, that is correct. It's it's ninety five percent of our premises on a network, and should they choose to sign up, they they, they can. And I, I I was really just trying to make the point that the, the targets that we're working to are targets set some some years back. I think the world has moved on, and I did I think uh, BDUK, for example, is now very much looking at the number of premises, percentage of premises connected at 24 megabits or, or below. And I, and I think that's, we've, we've always seen that that is really the ob ob objective. So I, I was maybe being myself a little bit pedantic in answering the earlier question. But, so I was working on the targets that were set previously, but I think everybody's aspiration is now to get people um, able to, should they choose, to be connected to a true super fast service. Um, Stuart, do you want to come in? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I think Michael Furman's absolutely right when he talks about the user experience. You know, it, you know, if you, if it doesn't matter whether you're notionally got super fast speeds, if you, if your experience is terrible, then uh, you're going to end up you're going to end up grumpy. Um, F FSB, you know, we we made representations to to Ofcom and others that uh, network providers shouldn't be able be allowed to advertise. Uh, you know, super fast speeds. You know, up to up to 10 megabits per second doesn't mean anything at all if you're getting a if you're actually getting a very poor poor uh, uh, poor poor experience. And we were pleased to see Ofcom move on that. On on, on Mike's point, um, I, I don't think I would want to second guess Audit Scotland, who, who said that they're uh, that they're on track to, to to meet the meet the targets. One point that I would make is that. Uh, Available connections to small and medium-sized businesses l lag behind the general uh, the general population, specifically because there's such a high proportion of of small businesses in rural areas and in business parks, which are often poorly served by uh, by by the current intervention. So, if we're going to develop a new program of interventions, it would be great to see uh, the business community especially targeted, because that's where we think we'll get the most bang for our buck. Glenn, I'm going to bring you in here to be the adjudicator on what it actually means? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I think we, you know, in Ofcom we recognise the point that Michael Foreman and Stuart McKinnon just made about the up to, the up to point, the, the kind of actual lived experience of uh, residential and, and business customers. Um, we, we have developed uh, with industry voluntary broadband speeds uh, code of conduct and uh, particularly focused on kind of business, business services. Uh, with all of the main communications providers being signatories to it. And that uh, requires them, once they're signed up, to, to provide transparent information at the point of sale, so at that kind of contractual point that you, I think, rightly rightly made, uh, and to manage any speed-related problems and to allow, importantly, to allow customers to exit uh, when their speeds fall below a, a minimum threshold. Um, but we recognise it is it's a voluntary, you know, it is a voluntary code. Um, and uh, although, you know, it would seem that the communications providers are are sticking to it, it's a first step for us. And I think it's the thing that we need to think about what what next um, to make sure that people are actually getting the speeds that they're, they're, they think they're signing up to. Uh, Sorry, would you like to add anything? Or I, are you... No, I'm very happy that everybody's answered okay. your question as well. I think Jamie's got an addis additional question on that. Digital questions, can you hear a bit? Thank you. I'll, I'll try and keep them brief and short. But um, on the 
the point that um, Glenn Preston made there uh, on, and this is about regulation of how the people sell these products. Um, the, it's all very well having a termination <coughs> right if you're not getting the speeds that you first thought you might get. But the problem for people who are at those speeds is that they probably don't have any choice or any other uh, service providers to go to. So if you're in an area where you thought you might get a couple of meg and you're, not, you're only getting one and a half or two, it's all very well terminating your contract, but then you're left with no internet at all. And I wonder if what Ofcom is, you know, a voluntary code is, is a nice idea, but how far should uh, you recommend that our governments uh, could go to actually make sure that people get the speeds that they were promised when they signed the contracts? And that if by, uh, you know, uh, that they cannot be just held to, to sort of ransom in the sense that well, I can cancel. You can cancel your contract if you're not happy, Mr. Customer. But that's not good enough for people if they've got no, nowhere else to turn to. I, I mean, I think it's an interesting question and one that all of us will have had in our mailbags. But it, it's wandering a wee bit a, away from the budget uh, side of it. So Perhaps, could I ask I, you to? I think, given the context of the could I ask you to, to give a, a succinct question. answer to that, please? Yeah, no, no I, I mean, I think we absolutely recognise the point, the point you made. I mean, one, one of the uh, provisions of the UK Digital Economy Bill that's currently before uh, the Westminster Parliament um, will allow us to take enforcement action and remedy the consequences of a breach of the new universal service obligation. And we will be able to find communications providers up to 10% of their turnover. Um, and that is a significant new power um, that we haven't had previously and I think should go some way um, to uh, allowing the, the type of remedy that... that um, that, that you kind of describe, um, but we do recognise the point that you make that if you had to have no alternative provider, you know what what next for you? And I think that's the kind of broader question that we're all trying to, to address. Okay, is there any more questions on that particular line, or Johnny? Given a uh, morning panel, I, I think the questions I was going to ask have largely been addressed already. But uh, if, if I maybe just flesh out a, a couple of things, please. And one of them was whether this much quoted some 412 million, do the panel consider that's been well spent thus far? Um, Professor, I'm going to let you go first on that. From a technical point of view, I think yes. In terms of the way that those assets are now in private hands and, and there it seems to be very little control over how they're used, I think no. Okay. Um, Stuart Robertson, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, um, yeah, I, I, obviously, I think that it, it certainly in the islands and islands it has been well spent. And I think that while I think it's true uh, largely what Professor Fullman says that the um, ability of, for, for example, of community projects to get affordable uh, connections from, from the infrastructure is, is still an issue. Um, the uh, access is to an extent open, um, and the, the new ducts that have been put in, for example, are open to other users under the normal regime that Ofcom has agreed with BT. So it, it's not that there is no access to this publicly funded infrastructure. I think maybe what, what um, the professor is, is saying is, is the access is still not affordable enough or easy enough um, to, to be usable. Okay, so you, you, do you want to comment on that? Um, my experience of it to date is that the money has been well spent to meet the objective that it had been set at the time, which was to connect as many people as possible for the smallest amount of money, which was a very sensible objective. I think things have changed, demand has changed, expectations have changed, um, and technologies marching on as well. I think I, I probably feel that, um, to disagree with Michael, that the fact that the network is in private hands is potentially a good thing because of the pace of change and the ability to create competition. But having said that, there's very little competition for the rural areas of Scotland, and that's the challenge that we are continually faced with is how to stimulate that competition. And even if it was competition between internet service providers through wholesale open access ducts that are owned by OpenReach, that would be much better than the position that we're in now. And it would go some way to answering uh, Jamie Green's point about um, having competition for internet service providers in areas that are very remote and rural. I'm, I'm one of those people who 
uh, tried to move away from my provider and three months later finally got reconnected back to the same one because there was no choice despite advertising. So I have a great deal of sympathy with that. And I think that competition in internet service provision over uh, technology that's already in place would be a really strong strand to be um, developing. Stuart uh, McKinnon, do you want to say anything on that? Um, you know, I, I would again reflect on the Audit Scotland report suggesting that the, the contracts are, are, are delivering what was, what was asked of them. Uh, I would agree with Zoe, though, that, that demand and expectations are changing amongst both consumers and, uh, and businesses. Um, and also, if we're going to really um, reap, reap the rewards from the, the, the investment that, that's been made, and we need to, we, you know, we need to stop. We need to build upon the infrastructure. You know, we need to develop uh, Scotland's digital skills and, and digital businesses as well. If we're going to get reap true value from from that investment, Glenn. So the the direct answer uh, to Mr. Finney's question is that the Ofcom doesn't do the kind of consideration of um, value of money um, for the broadband rollout in Scotland, but we have no, no reason to second guess the um, the Audit Scotland report that Stuart McKinnon just. Uh, just mentioned. I mean, our, our focus has been on um, the point that's been made by, by the other panel members about increasing competition with BT uh, so as to incentivise that, that investment in the system, uh, recognising how challenging that can be uh, in, in rural Scotland, uh, as well as trying to support the thinking of governments on the public investment in those kind of commercially unviable areas. Um, we did a digital communications review last year, um, where we're, which is, will feature as part of our strategy over the course of the next um, couple of years as well, around uh, opening up um, BT's infrastructure, which has already been mentioned, the kind of ducts and, ducts and poles stuff. Um, and it probably hasn't escaped anybody's notice that um, yesterday uh, we announced we were going to proceed with the, the formal notification to require the legal separation of OpenReach. Um, from BT uh, after we felt that BT had failed to offer voluntary um, proposals that address the competition concerns that we, we have. Um, there is lots and lots of information on that available to the, to the committee uh, on the Ofcom website, which we published yesterday. For that response, certainly it's the case that uh, a large private multinational corporation has done very well from public money. C can I ask, um, and that may be, of course, entirely to do with the contract. I'm not suggesting the contract terms haven't been met, that maybe the wrong contract was, was drawn if public benefit should be the outcome of public expenditure, not private profit. Can I ask why there is a cap, please, of £1,700 and how much BT can spend in each prem premises? That just may be a legal... Um, Stuart, yes. And, and, sorry, I'm just going to sort of point, point out that... Uh, all the committee members have got questions they want to ask, and there's quite a, quite a lot of them. I'm conscious of time. So if, if, if people would like to give as, as succinct answer as they could, then I'll give everyone the opportunity to come in uh, without reducing the quality of your answer, because that's a good question. Sorry, Stuart. The £1,700 uh, was something agreed um, by BDUK at an earlier point to try and um, speed up the rollout of the BDUK contracts across the UK. And, and certainly our understanding is that it's not a cap, it's a requirement that if uh, it's going to cost more than £1,700 per premise uh, in a certain bit of rollout, that BT are obliged to let the uh, authority, uh, in our case, Hands and Enterprise, know that it's going to cost more. And we can then make a decision of whether we, want, we see that as value for money. So uh, there is no suggestion that we can only spend up to uh, 1,700 on any premise. We can go above that if we believe it's value for money. Are you able to say then, Mr Robertson, if, if I may, with a, an obvious supplementary to that, and how many instances of that occurred and what constitutes value for money? <laughs> well, uh, I don't have uh, all the figures, but I do know that in certain instances we, we have uh, gone over that, uh, that amount as, as we get to the more challenging uh, areas. Um, we're certainly looking what constitutes value for money, where we would certainly be looking to uh, try and give us a fair um, coverage as possible over the various local authority areas, for example. So we may, um, in the Western Isles, where the coverage is lower, we would we perhaps uh, agree to a, a higher than £1,700 per premise uh, uh, rollout than we might in Murray, for example. And who adjudicates on that figure of what's... Uh, you know, that it's going to cost 1900 or 2000 Where does that figure? Is that BT that come up with that figure and then... 
they tell us what, what it, it's, it's looking like, and we obviously encourage them to, to go away and try and find a, a better, cheaper way to do it, but still the, the effective coverage. Um, so yes, the, the cost information comes from BT. Okay, thank you very much. Right, it's got a small supplementary. It is. Um, so we mentioned about um, internet service providers and no choice. I can understand that in community rollout, there is no choice because you are with the community provider. But if BT has reached your premise, what is stopping another service provider using that fibre, that link, so that you get an, a, a service from them? And I'm picking up that there's an issue there. It may be that Stuart's actually better, Stuart Robertson's better place to answer this than me, but... Um, my understanding is that that competition is open and ISPs can provide over that network. Um, they may not choose to because they may not see enough customers in that particular area. Um, I don't know. Do you want to? Sorry. Uh, in, in Zoe's case, I know that it's um, because her exchange is an exchange activate exchange, which has a very limited number of, of potential ISPs. And I think this is a, a, a very valid point. As we go forwards and seek solutions uh, for 100%, I think it's very important that we get solutions that are uh, as close as possible to the wider market uh, delivery and that we don't end up with bespoke uh, niche solutions for rural areas. We want to, as many people as possible to be part of the full market, the, the mass market, so that the service they get and the prices that are offered and that the... the, the, the uh, uh, range of choice that they get in, in, from ISPs is as, as close to urban areas as possible. Glenn, do you want to come in on that? I see you nodding. Yeah, well, I mean, it would simply just to be affirm. I think to reaffirm the two points. I think there's, there can be both technical limitations and then and then market market limitations. I think we have heard from other providers, um, you know, that they're not they're not willing to go to those places at, at the moment because they aren't they aren't commercially commercially viable. Uh, and I mean, this goes to this goes to you know Ofcom's desire to open up to open up the infrastructure, particularly on the ducts and, and poles side, uh, and the comments I already made in relation to the legal separation of open reach as well. That we're we you know we're trying to drive. Um, that type of attractive market for the other providers. Okay, I'm going to leave that there and move on to the next question, if I may, which actually comes from Rhoda as well. So, <laughs> which has been largely covered, to be honest, about um, the costs of rollout out. And if I'm correct in that, what the estimate is to get um, to the government's 100% target, we're looking at um, two to three hundred million for Highlands and Islands and double for Scotland. Is that correct? So we're talking about maybe 600 million to reach the 2021 target. The, the, the point I made earlier was really just to, to say that uh, looking to, to history, um, in the first generation broadband, it, it took as much public intervention in the Highlands and Islands as the rest of Scotland to get to the, the same point. So I, I, I don't really have any information about how much it might cost in the rest of Scotland. And, I, and as I said, I'm really basing my estimate on the Highlands and Islands figure on um, previous uh, work done, uh, we haven't done any analysis at this point because the um, reaching 100% is being led by the, the Scottish Government uh, Digital Directorate and not HIE. Um, and how much of that funding would people have estimated would have come from Europe and is Brexit going to affect the levels of funding available? Um, we didn't use any European funding in our previous project because the, the, the amount uh, available to us at that time was of the, of the total required was, was a relatively small amount and so it was chosen not to, to use it. I, I, I can't make any estimate of what might be uh, possible in, in going forwards about how much that be European funding. As, as far as I'm aware, the only European funding available currently to the Highlands and Islands for broadband purposes is around about 20 million um, bounds um, from the uh, structural funds. Okay. Sorry, do you want to...? Yeah, just from a Community Broadband Scotland perspective, £9 million of the £16.5 million pound budget is from uh, SRDP, so £4.5 million of that is directly from Europe and the rest was matched by Scottish Government. But we don't believe it's at risk. Um, there's been a an agreement put in place that the funds don't need to be committed um, until we actually exit Europe, so we've got plenty of time to spend it, so it shouldn't be at risk. 
No one's. Anyone else want to add? I mean, I'm happy to move on if Freddie, if you, if you feel. Okay, the next question, uh, Richard, I think, is, is, is from you. Okay. Um, Professor Michael Foreman, you, you said, and I wrote it down, digital deprivation. Um, so many, many of the areas that are in Scotland, Scotland's a lovely country, but it has a lot of geographic challenging areas to go to. Um, so does any of the witnesses, can they provide any examples of pilot projects where we've been helped to boost mobile coverage in those geographic challenging areas? And, and if you know any pilot projects, are you aware of any funding, uh, how, how the funding was, was raised? Or, um, I know of, of, of one project where I think it cost about £130,000 uh, to go to a physically challenging area. Um, do you know of any other projects, maybe up in the Highlands Islands or in any areas in Scotland? Maybe it would be appropriate, Richard, to start with Zoe on that. And then, yeah. and, and w would that be all right, Zoe, please? Yeah. Can I just clarify, are you asking about mobile connectivity as opposed to fixed broadband? Or Whatever, any, 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 well, it could be, it could be, um, you know, at the end of the day, delivering, you know, one of you also said delivering fibre to these physically challenging areas would cost. Yeah. So it could be uh, Wi-Fi, it could be through satellite, it could be through whatever new technology is coming on. I can talk about the Community Broadband Scotland projects, which mm -hmm. um, there's 15 which are operational around remote and rural parts of Scotland. And they have typically used fixed wireless access. So this is um, what we would call fixed broadband, but delivered through wireless connectors. And the typical, well, the average cost of those projects that are active just now has been about £500 a premise. I think uh, we haven't estimated fibre costs. We've never received any quotes for fibre costs for those particular areas, but it would be significantly more than that, uh, mul yeah, a multiple of many. Um, so it gives you a flavour, but there's so many variations in the costings, <coughs> depending on where the backhaul's coming from, and depending on how they connect to that, and depending on the detail of the geography that they're within that can affect those costs, uh, both up and down. Does, does anyone want to particularly pick up on the mobile uh, aspect of it? Because I think that was part of Richard's question. Uh, the professor was wanting to come in. I'll, my clip would like. Mobile aspect, but on the delivering through, through fixed wireless. So my colleague, Professor Peter Bunneman, uh, has been very involved on the West Coast, and I've been marginally involved and there are certainly successful projects there, which, which Zoe, of course, knows about. And one of the things that's happened recently is to set up an internet exchange there so that the uh, different community networks can pool their backhaul, which is very creative and, and a good way to do things, I think. Um, the other thing that's happened is Scottish Government has put some money into building some fibre a community-built fibre. There were difficulties with that. I don't know very much of the detail, but there were difficulties in terms of connecting to the BT backhaul to get back to the internet exchange here in Edinburgh, uh, which delayed things. I myself get my broadband here in Edinburgh using those technologies just so I understand what they do. So my signal comes to my house from Summerhall, about half a mile, and I get 50 megabits a second each way, and it's a community broadband project, and I pay £25 a month, and it's as good as I would get from a commercial provider. So I, I think that there's a lot of scope for doing these things in places where you can get backhaul. The communities can, at relatively low cost, produce these kinds of connectivity for small numbers of people. You can't do tens of thousands this way, but you can certainly do hundreds of people this way with fixed wireless and deliver very fast speeds. Stuart, UK standards at least. Okay. I, I'm immediately jealous when you talk about those levels of speed, uh, as, along with everyone else on the committee in rural areas. Uh, 0.2 megabytes re regulated means that I get no speed at all, really, most of the time. But Stuart, do you want to talk about phone masks? Yeah. I, I would like to talk about, about mobile phones. It's a, it's a bit of a 
pet, pet subject. Um, you know, just as Scotland lags behind England of ev on every measure of broadband connectivity, Scotland lags behind England on every level of mobile uh, connectivity, including coverage to the premises, but, but especially geographic coverage. Um, we were pleased to see the Scottish Government's mobile phone action plan, which has, I think, four proposed pilots where the Scottish Government's granting um, special rates relief planning permissions and, and the like uh, to, to boost coverage in especially poorly served areas. I, I'm aware of other pilot projects. I, I'm just not sure whether these pilot projects are they're great. Are they sufficient to close the to close the gap uh, on on mobile coverage in in Scotland, especially if we want to catch up with with England? Um, you know, what, one of the one of the reports the FSB recently published was looking at um, at bank branch closures. Um, the areas that are, are seeing bank bank branches closing are also the areas most poorly served by digital connectivity. How do we ensure that communities aren't aren't left behind? Um, while we've seen quite a lot of intervention into the broadband market, we've just not seen that same level of intervention in, in the mobile market, and it means that many many areas are, are very very poorly served in Scotland. Len, do you want to come in on that? Specifically on the on the mobile the mobile point. So there's there's two or three things that are probably worth sharing with the the committee. So um, I, I mentioned earlier the kind of lower frequency spectrum um, availability for uh, for 4G services, which generally helps to just extend mobile coverage over longer distances and deeper into into buildings. So we're you know do it as part of our work, for example, on the upcoming 700 megahertz auction, which I mentioned in response to Mr. Green's question. We're looking at how that might be used um, to deliver um, those kind of longer range and deeper into buildings solutions. And we're also looking um, at whether we can consider that kind of insight out model that we discussed with uh, with Mr. Stevenson as well. Um, one of the other areas of interest which we haven't touched on yet is uh, the Home Office's emergency services network procurement. Um, we're quite keen to understand all the service conditions for that um, and how they will apply to different sites and whether there would be any constraints on their capacity to supply wider services. We think there might be scope there, but we're trying to get more information from um, both the UK government and have a discussion with the Scottish government about how that fits with their mobile action plan uh, that Stuart McKinnon uh, just mentioned as well. Um, the final thing that's probably worth mentioning is we will do uh, a new version of our, our annual Connected Nations report, uh, which should be out sometime before Christmas, uh, and we're changing the way that we, we do the metrics on that. So we're looking at geographic coverage, so landmass and indoor coverage, um, rather than some of the outdoor uh, premises coverages that's happened before, that, which I think will give us a truer reflection uh, on, on the challenge that faces us on mobile coverage. Stuart McKinnon was talking about... Uh, getting a signal. Um, many people over the years have been opposed to masts being erected. You know, you go out to work in the morning, you come back and there's a mast sitting outside. And I remember as a councillor, I actually actively got a, a company to move that their mast about 300 yards you know, over a railway and, and basically out, you know, hid it away from people. We've also seen the innovative ways of, you know, they've designed a mast like a tree, um, you know, and, and like a flagpole. Um, do you think the public now accepts that they need coverage uh, and they need their phone? Uh, do you think people now accept uh, that, that mass, you know, can be, is there any opposition now to mass being put up? Do you think the, the, also the fear of getting cancer from a mast? Uh, uh, has dissipated. Um, I wonder if we could direct that to start off with to Stuart Robertson, see if he's had any views from the Highlander, and then to the Professor, and then probably, if that's all right, leave it there. That that that, if we get satisfactory answers, Stuart, would you would you? I, I think there's a much greater acceptance that if we want the technologies, we we, we have to have the infrastructure to go with it, and I and I think the fears about um, uh, must ha have have uh, receded. Um, but I think it, it's still the case that um, many masts in the hands lands go to go to the local authority planning people, and there are discussions about the uh, the best siting for, for for masts, and often that there, there may be um, requirements to, to move the site of the, uh, them. Um, but I think there is a much greater recognition that, as I said, that we, we need more masts if we want better 
coverage. And I think the other thing on mobile sector is to recognise it's in a, quite a different place from the fixed sector in that the mobile operators are uh, now um, spending a lot of their own money and rolling out coverage. So there's, there's a, there will come a point, I'm sure, that there will need to be intervention with public funds, but we haven't reached that point yet. So it's not easy to put public money in now in the mobile sector, knowing that you're going to get value for money. But no doubt that point will come. So do you have a view on mass and acceptability? On acceptability, I was always concerned that schools found it difficult to put masks because they're a very... Schools are very well located with respect to the population, so there would be an ideal place to put masks, but that doesn't happen because of the concerns that you talked about, which I think are ill-founded. Just on masks and, and funding, the mobile infrastructure project hasn't been discussed, but when you talk about has money been well spent, that bit, I think, wasn't well spent because we didn't get any masts. But that's, a, that's an aside. Uh, I'm going to leave that as an aside, if I may, Professor. And, and Murray, you've got a question, I think, on, uh, on challenges. Uh, yes, thank you, Convener. I mean, I'm sure you'll all be aware of the report that the Scottish Futures Trust published earlier this year, which obviously outlined some of the challenges that we're going to face. So it was really just to ask you what financial support you think will be needed to try and overcome some of the challenges that they identified. Who'd like to lead on that? Glenn, it looks like you're up first. Quite happy to, yeah, quite happy to have a first go. I mean, we, we've, we've kind of touched on this a little bit already, I think, um, in that none of us appear to have a, a figure. Um, certainly from an Ofcom point of view, um, the technical advice that we will give to the UK government um, by the end of the year you know, will, will allow us to have a sense of what we think uh, the different costs and technologies might be um, to deliver um, whatever the broadband USO ends up being. So we know there's the kind of safety net v future proofing approaches um, uh, and we will, you know, we will share that analysis uh, with with the UK government, um, and then they will have to make a, a you know a public policy choice about uh, you know where where they want that broadband USO to come out, uh, and what type of public intervention intervention will be necessary to achieve it across the UK, including in including in Scotland. What we don't have yet is just a a number um, that says it's going to cost this much either for the whole of the UK or uh, separately for Scotland. Does anyone want to, uh, Stuart? Yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't have a, a number either, but I, I think that they, one of the most important things for rural Scotland is that the, um, it, whether we're talking fixed or mobile, what, what it, we require is the foundation stone. That's the greater um, um, a, amount of fibre further out into the more rural parts so that the backbone infrastructure is there um, to allow the solutions to be built on top. And um, this is obviously particularly evident when it comes to perhaps island communities where they're, they're, they're served by um, microwave wireless at the moment, but actually need the higher um, capacity that the fibre brings. And um, if we could get that infrastructure in, and it may well be costly given the relatively small population of some of the islands, for example, I think we need to look at the investment not just about um, counting broadband connections. We need to think about delivery of public services. Um, we need to think um, about the, the um, stemming depopulation. We need to think in the widest terms about the use of that investment. And um, it may well be a large amount of money, but it potentially could be money where it very well spent. Marge, if you were to follow up on that. Yeah, well, it was just a, another question, really. I mean, that report also pointed out uh, some of the the particular issues, I mean, it talks about house builders and how they're reluctant to install fibre uh, fiber to the home uh, and new housing developments. So, I mean, when it comes to issues like that, what other problems do you uh, see that need to be addressed and need to be tackled? Stuart McKinnon, I'm going to let you go on that one. Um, you know, the, the SFT's report is, you know, is, you know, the one looking at our ambitions for, for 2030. You know, I think... You know, they would be much better placed to say how much all of that's how much that all that's going to cost. I think in terms of uh, of costs, you know, I think uh, Stuart's absolutely right to to point out, 
you know, what's the cost of not doing, what's the cost of not doing things, you know, from a, from a small business point of view, HMRC are increasingly expecting you to, for instance, file your, file your accounts online um, on, a, on a quarterly basis. If you do not have suitable internet access, what impact does that have, have on, your, uh, on, on, your, on your business? Um, with, while, you know, we're looking for Scottish businesses to do much more of their interaction with the state at large um, online, but if you don't have good infrastructure, <laughs> then that means that you're going to have more people uh, using old-fashioned services, either face-to-face -face or, or telephone services, uh, which will put greater pressure on, uh, on the state and on, on costs. In relation to the specific points about about uh, housing estates, um, you know, we've, I've, he I've heard similar complaints about, um, um, about Business estates, so out-of-town business estates, where the fibre has been built as part of the <clears throat> as part of the default, and that may maybe the the planning system. I, I understand that there has been recent changes to the planning system to try and uh, address that particular issue, but I would need to I need to look into that. Does anyone else want to add anything on that, Stuart, and and then uh, Michael? Um, just on the point about um, new housing estates and new business parks, I think that that will, um, to find a way to make sure that these new developments are adequately covered with broadband is, is essential if uh, we're going to meet the 100% commitment, because at some point in the, in the, the, the near future, uh, effectively, we'll have an intervention area to, to go forward with a new procurement to, to put in place the further rollout. But that intervention area will not change through the contract so that there will be continually new builds that will be outside the, 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 um, the project. So it's essential that we don't come to the end of, the, of 2021 and then find that the new builds have been left uh, outside um, the uh, rollout. So um, I know that BT are doing more to ensure that, that they're going to put fibre into larger estates. And um, we also have to find a solution to make sure that uh, new business parts are also adequately covered. So, so I can understand that, sorry. It, it, are you suggesting that all new housing projects over a certain size should have a planning re requirement on it to provide fibre to, to the home? I'm not necessarily saying, saying that, but I, I'm saying that we, we need to find a way of making sure that new developments get the, the, proper, the full infrastructure, whether that's through planning, whether it's through um, buyers not buying, uh, where the, the infrastructure's not there, you know, um, the power of the market. It's about developers maybe doing more to, to see the, the um, uh, usefulness of having fibre connections. Perhaps it might make the houses more easy to sell. Um, it, it, I'm just saying that uh, we need to find some solution to make sure that uh, going forwards, as we build new infrastructure, we put in broadband infrastructure at the same time. Michael, I, I think you're going to have a view on this, I, I feel. In our 2010 report, we identified fibre rating, which has been already mentioned this morning, and the lack of any planning requirements as, as an issue that was slowing things down. So we require sewage, we require water, we require electricity, we should require fibre. But there is a problem with requiring fibre because you can't just put a bit of fibre in, you have to connect it to somewhere. And so you need to interact with the local providers in order to get a connection back to the internet, and that can be difficult in rural places for reasons we've already discussed of, of a natural monopoly on those things. In towns, I think most new buildings actually do do this, but in rural areas it's difficult because you only have one source of supply and connecting to that may be very difficult, make it prohibitive. And the, and the fibre rating may also be playing, playing a role in inhibiting those developments. Are you happy, Murray, with this? Yeah, uh, I just think it would be interesting to find out, you know, if, if what dialogue has taken place, if any dialogue has taken place with developers and house builders to see how that might be progressed. But I th no, I th that can't be answered today. I think that's something we can ask the yeah. Cabinet Secretary when he comes in, but I think it's a very relevant point that <clears throat> to make sure that the costs are identified now and people start building those in rather mm -hmm. than relying on the government post-2021 to fill, to fill the gap. Mm -hmm. So I think that we'll, we'll make a note of that. Peter, you've got some questions on community broadband and I'm going to look to Zoe to answer these um, 
in the main, unless unless anyone else wants to come in. So, Peter. Uh, yeah, thanks, convener. Uh, yes, community broadband Scotland. I, would, I need to, want to dig a wee bit deeper into that. I mean, it's been very useful in the particularly hard to reach areas, and we, and we understand that. And you're uh, you are variously funded. Some of this funding comes from SRDP money, I believe. Um, I just wondered, do any of the schemes funded by Community Broadband Scotland provide models of operation for other community-led projects, uh, especially in remote areas? And also, how can, how can value for money be ensured within these com community broadband uh, projects? Uh, you know, I'm interested to see that, that you can you identify that you are producing uh, value for money. Yes, um, <clears throat> I think you're quite right that there are good examples within the projects that we funded to date about how other communities could operate. And there's been some really strong projects that we've supported. Michael mentioned one earlier, which was um, what we refer to as the West Highland Access Network, which helps uh, small communities get economies of scale through backhaul and sharing um, some of the services around that. That's a fantastic example that would be worth replicating. Again, it does rely on having connectivity in somewhere and that comes with its own challenges. Um, there are other projects, for example, Badenoch Broadband, which set out on its own, um, I think started off with leader funding and we've funded a bit of an upgrade recently. Uh, that's a really nice growing business actually in the Speyside area. And they're extending their coverage to work with uh, they're hoping to attract up to 300 customers on that network. Um, there's, others, there's other examples. I mean, Mary Kirk's another one that's been winning awards for a similar kind of model. Uh, again, developing into a small social enterprise, a small business enterprise. And again, looking at customer base of two to 300 people, uh, premises rather. And um, all of those are good examples of what's possible. They happen to have fairly... Um, strong and, and business-minded people involved in running those networks. And that can sometimes be a challenge for people that don't have some of those skills within their community. So that's something that we need to support more of. Um, and I think in terms of value for money, they are great value for money insofar as they reach, as I mentioned earlier, those average cost of those projects in capital terms is about £500 a premise, which is great. Um, but I think that we do need to look further ahead and think about how those projects could eventually upgrade potentially to more and more fibre. And are they bringing enough revenue in to do that? We've done some work on a study which is not complete yet um, to consider that. And it is looking actually quite positive that with the customers that they've attracted, um, they will be able to eventually do some upgrade work with the revenues raised and to pay staff to do that rather than act as volunteers. But as I say, these are quite exceptional and, and very strong projects. And it's also worth saying that those projects are charging in the region of £25 a month to £30 a month per customer. So again, not, not charging excessively. So the potential is there, but it is a, these projects have grown uh, using volunteers and have been in kind of negative cash flow places over their lifetime they've built up over a number of years so they're strong now but they will have relied on a huge amount of personal input to get them to that stage so how do you feel it is given that you do need a, a local champion to, to to get the thing up and running i mean is it sustainable long term is that local champion need to be involved with the project in years to come or can he then step back and say it's now in place we can let it run I think in the case of those projects, and there's also a similar one in Loch Hill, because they're starting to generate enough revenue to pay staff, they become more sustainable and they're training up so that there's more and more people around. But that is quite a long and difficult journey, I think, to be fair. And those people have to be commended for the efforts they've put into getting that far. So uh, can it be part of the solution? I think it can, but it is a pretty unique and challenging way to deliver the solution. And uh, I think we do need to take care of uh, the sustainability of those in the long term. So that will only really be something that's evident after they've been operating for, say, 10 years and seeing how those dynamics change. There's also potential that um, other competitors could come in and, and squeeze the marketplace that these community projects have, have got at the moment. 
um, and that would be pretty damaging for them if they were unable to compete with that in terms of price or service. Uh, so I'm not saying it's not possible, but it, it remains difficult. But I mean, uh, you could... You could no, sorry, can I just... I'm conscious of the time, yeah, and, no. and, 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 and what I would like to try and drag you back to mm. is, is the, the, the final question that you mm. indicated you, you might like to ask. Yeah. And it, it is, the, the, the Scottish Government will be considering the future of Community Broadband Scotland in reaching the 100%. And what action would you and the panel th like to see regarding the provi provision of Community Broadband provision in the future? Broadband Scotland's had the most enormous challenges in order to get some of its newer projects moving. Uh, they're not of our making. There are things like state aid decision being changed and procurement regulations being changed. So I'd like to see um, a good shot at getting some new projects delivered and at extending the models that I've just described. And I think that that will um, give us a bit more information about the extent to which those kind of projects can be part of the longer term solution. So I think it's a uh, a testing time in that we need to get some more things done to be able to show the role that these could take. But I wouldn't want to um, impose that solution on any community. I think it's something that you need to want to be involved with and feel quite strongly about. I don't think it should be your only choice in terms of the way to get broadband. Can I, can I ask as a supplementary to that, is, is, is your budget... Um, and, and obviously the, the last 5%, which was Peter was indicating, is what do you want from your budget for the, for, from between now and 2021 to make sure that you play your, the valuable role that you are playing to deliver to the, to the very last houses? Um, the budget that we have is sufficient to connect, I think, somewhere between eight and 10,000 premises. So I think there's a huge question coming on the back of the open market review, which is going to start imminently, uh, as to which communities want to get involved in that type of solution and what is the scale of the problem yet to be addressed. So our budget will take us to 10,000 roughly. Um, beyond that, CBS doesn't have a budget to take it further. So are you suggesting it's double or treble or quadruple what it should be? What do you perceive the need is going to be? I mean, you must have had some idea of what you're going to be asked to do. I think because R100 is still a little bit ambiguous, I'm sorry this is not answering your question very very well. <laughs> to, get, to get your plea across so we okay. can understand it. Um, we could do a lot more, you're right, and we could extend a lot further, and I think it would be good value for money to reach that target and to get people involved. My view is that empowerment is a really strong part of, of what Scotland's good at doing and is a really strong part of increasing demand for broadband. Uh, so we could, I mean, we could spend an awful lot more, tens of millions more, uh, if people wanted to take that approach. We're doing a bit of work at the moment to assess the um, interest in that from the communities that are already expressing interest in what we're offering, just to check, check in with them. What, what's giving me the caveat is that some communities have um, expressed an interest in just having broadband done to them rather than getting hands-on. And we need to offer those communities that choice through the R100 wider programme. And it's just helping them understand those distinctions and their level of involvement that they might want to take, I think, would, would help set the budget. OK. Peter, are you happy? Being with that, yeah. Um, Right, yeah. Small supplementary. Given that the promise is 100% um, and Community Broadband Scotland is going to have to be involved in delivering that 100% because most of what's left is the hard to reach areas, where would you see your budget going to, to be on track to deliver that with technologies that are sustainable into the future? Do you mean in terms of geographic locations or technology types or? Both. Both. Um, in terms of geographic locations, I think we, we feel our target uh, customer base is, is the most remote and rural. So places that are really quite small um, and far flung, uh, living in what I would call the nicest parts of Scotland. But um, again, kind of dispersed or uh, geographically kind of stretched out communities. And 
Um, I would like to see the other parts of R100 extending fibre out to make those viable projects. I think that's a really important thing. Um, I do think the technologies are likely to be mainly wireless, but I'm, we're working on encouraging communities to get involved in, in sort of self-dig for fibre because I think that would be a really more future-proofed way of tackling some of the issues. So again, that depends on community resources and willingness to literally get your hands dirty. Um, but we're just adapting the package of support we offer to give people more choices in how they engage with that and helping them understand the difference between getting involved in something like a, a, a fibre self-dig versus um, connecting wireless projects, which can be pretty easy to do, to be honest, in terms of um, the skills and equipment that people would work with. So I think it's about giving people a bit more of a choice in how they choose to get involved in it and giving them flexibility in an, an understanding in how they make that choice. But for me, the customer base for CBS will always be the most remote areas. Sorry. I'll put a figure on. I can't until I think we know more about the results from the open market review and which premises need to be connected and where they are. I think that would be much easier. I mean, no, I don't think I can guess. Um, so, sorry. Can I just say that as things develop? It, what would be very helpful for you to keep this committee informed yeah. so that we know where we're going because it, it's an ongoing issue yes. uh, for everyone. So if you could keep us informed on that. Now, Mike, you want to come in. I'm going to let you come in very briefly, if I may. The, the scale of the problem is more like 200,000 premises rather than 10,000 premises. I think Community Broadband Scotland has done a fantastic job, but Zoe's pointed out some of the issues of scaling it up. So one is the, the know-how, and actually funding some training. There's now, I think, enough activity that there, it really is possible to build on what you already have and for people to learn. You can see, if you look at the map, that this stuff is infectious in the sense where it's happened, nearby it starts happening. And we need to find ways of making that happen on a bigger scale. And I think funding for that would be well spent. I mean, just I mean, one thing worth mentioning is um, the cross-party group on digital participation has just been reconstituted. Ofcom acts as the secretariat to that. Um, it's first meeting uh, since the May election is this evening. Um, and I mean, there are two strands to the work. There's the big infrastructure questions that we've addressed, and then the second is the is the kind of skills piece and training piece. Um, and although we don't have as a as a regulator a kind of de a direct role in that, we're very happy to use that um, to use that group to explore some of the issues that, that Michael Foreman and Zoe have just mentioned. There, if I may, uh, Jamie, you've got some questions which I think are going to be in the direction of Stuart McKinnon. So. Um, skipped question 16 or yeah yes I, I've, I've, I've skipped my question on, on the fact that, that there is shortness of time and I was going to ask the uh, panel members if they'd like to give a written response to it afterwards um, I have a couple of questions but I'm actually going to shrink it down because uh, in the, in the, uh, for the benefit of time but also because I'd like to bring up another point about budget specifically so I have one question for uh, uh, Stuart McKinnon, <clears throat> if he, uh, what work has been done at the FSB uh, in terms of what if we don't do this? What if we get this wrong? What is the, what is the negative effect to the Scottish economy if we don't get this uh, digital question right in the uh, within the term of this parliament? Because I think it'd be really helpful to know when we look at how much we have to spend, uh, you know, we're just looking at a cost to the purse. We're not looking at the upside of it or the ROI on that spend and it's actually more helpful to be able to make a spending decision if you know what the uh, negative out, uh, outcome is if you don't make that spend. So I wonder if you had any views on that. <coughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a number to say it, it, would, it would cost this much if we, if we don't do it but what we know is that three quarters of businesses say that digital is important or essential to their future growth plans. So for, for three in every four businesses they say our plans for growth involve digital technologies, and if they don't have good infrastructure, then they can't. Uh, then they can uh, use go down those those growth plans. 
Um, in addition, other work that we did suggests that across a wide range of industries, um, about four in ten of the of the largest businesses are going to be replaced by new uh, by new business models powered by digital technologies. So the you know, the, the, the disruption that we've seen in retail, for example, with the rise of e-commerce is very likely to happen to other industries that we can't even think about at the moment. And if those businesses, if those industries, those businesses of the future are going to be Scottish, then Scotland has to have the infrastructure to be able to cope with those industries. Appreciate the, the very succinct answer. Um, can we hear one of our may just raise a point about budget in general, because I think it's actually very relevant to what we're trying just, to achieve. Just before we do that, I wondered if anyone else felt they had a... I mean, I mean, Stuart Robertson might have an answer on how much it might cost in the Highlands not to deliver this. No, sorry, I don't have an, an answer on that, but I, I, I would e echo the points. I think digital, it, you know, it, it's not... It, it's essential everywhere, and it's not just about the economy. It's about the way people live, and, and I, I don't think there's any disagreement that uh, digital has to be 100%. Mm -hmm. but can, can I... The one thing that hasn't come up, and the one question that I haven't been able to ask, which was on skill shortages and, and, and delivery of it... We, I'm assuming all the panel accept it's not just about business this, it's about educating our children and giving them the ability to, to compete on a worldwide basis by having access to information on the web. I'm taking that as a given, but Zoe, do you want to come in on that? Um, not a particularly lengthy answer, but I totally agree that um, digital connectivity uh, would enhance personal skills for young people and adults learning. Uh, lots of people come back and feedback to us that they want to do online courses and increasingly schools are trying to do that with some of their more remote um, pupils. So I think it's a hugely, hugely important part of it. And um, just on the back of the previous question, we did a little bit of work, which I can send as a written bit of written evidence for you on the benefits of broadband. It doesn't answer your question about what would we lose out, but it does say something about the economic GVA um, uh, that would in, that would would come from increased connectivity. So I'll send that in. Sorry, my voice is going now. Apologies, Jamie. If you want a quick follow up, you, you, uh, that'd be very welcome. Uh, and I, for the record, I probably should have said that. Uh, uh, in terms of interest, I'm a member of the cross party group on digital participation. I commend the work that they do. Uh, if any other committee members are interested in that area, it's a fascinating group to be a member of, or at least to follow their proceedings. They're doing some great work in looking to the negative social uh, economic effects of not being included in the uh, uh, in Digital Scotland. Um, I think I have a more general, very quick question on uh, how we're going to formulate the scrutiny of the budget on this, because it's, it seems to be a very complex funding mechanisms in different parts of the country. Uh, you know, we know there's already been money spent on the 95%. We know there's a tender process coming up for next year. Uh, that we will have to make recommendations on how we get to that last difficult 130,000 premises. We know there's some spending commitments made last week from the UK government, from the autumn statement, around 740 million uh, for digital infrastructure. Um, so I guess, uh, given that Ofcom are already involved in working with the UK government a lot and advising them both technically and economically on how they can achieve their targets, how is that going to follow through to the devolved administrations and how are we going to make sure that there's a proper joined up discussion between money that's been committed from Westminster and money that's been committed in the budget that we're going to scrutinise uh, here? No, I'm, I'm going to limit that question to Glenn, if I may, okay. uh, it's just on a, on a timing basis. If anyone else feels that they particularly want to add something later, please, please write to us on, on that particular thing, but I'm going to limit that to Glenn, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, we absolutely recognise the, uh, you know, the, the many different schemes that both have existed and the, the commitments that, um, you know, different the different administrations have made, um, and the fact that it will be essential that the two governments have a dialogue in particular. Um, so, I think, I mean, I think, you know, if, if thinking about your scrutiny session um, with the cabinet secretary in December, one of the things that we in Ofcom are quite keen to see um, is is that kind of direct engagement between the two administrations to discuss uh, how all of this stuff fits together. Uh, and certainly, from our point of view, what it what it means uh, what it means for us in terms of how we exercise our regulatory functions 
difference um, because there are you know there are considerable differences uh, in a in a broadband USO for example that is about a safety net or floor uh, and the commitments to super fast uh, you know 100% super fast by 2021 uh, and we are you know we're, we're very keen that the administrations have a have a conversation and a dialogue which we would like to be involved in which I'm sure a number of the other partners represented here and elsewhere would like to to be involved in too um, so that we have a clear sense of when they want to do things and how much they think it's going to cost. Perfect. The last question is from, from uh, John. And I've, I've been told to be very quick, so I'll run through it. Um, I mean, it's in the whole area, really, of inequalities, digital participation, maybe touching on public services, because poorer people tend to use public services a bit more. Um, I mean, some figures we read are, are quite positive. Uh, home internet access has increased from 42% in 2003 to 80% in 2014. That's very good. But then, slightly more negative, uh, 98% of households with incomes over 40,000 have home internet access, but only 60% of households with incomes under 15,000. And, um, I mean, we're given figures, too, that 38% uh, of adults reported they had, they, had, they had used a local authority website for any purpose. Only 18% had used a government website. I mean, I saw the film recently, I, Daniel Blake, I don't know if you've seen that, the guy there who's unemployed doesn't know what to do with the mouse on the computer. So my question is, what can we do about all of that? Um, is it the schools or do we just try and get people a higher income and it's nothing to do with our actual digital side of things? Or should we put money specifically into this? It's a huge question. <laughs> Sorry. And, 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 I, and I am literally going to work from uh, my right army right, I, Michael, if I may, and go along the, the panel, Michael. So, as I said at the beginning, as we get more people online, those who are left behind are increasingly, in Scotland, increasingly in the bottom Simdi um, quintile, or whatever you want to look at. The, the further down you go, the more likely you are to be offline. If you're offline, you're likely to be suffering deprivation in other ways. I think it's essential that we focus on those areas. Some of them are rural, many of them are in our cities, and a large number of them are in Glasgow. One can pinpoint with the, with the Ofcom data where people are online, where they're not online, and how that links to SIMD, and it's, it's stark. Uh, things are getting much better, but there's a hard core of deprivation that we're not hitting hard enough at the moment. Glenn, do you want to follow? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's a combination, a combination of the issues that you mentioned. There, there's quite a fundamental question for Ofcom as a regulator, um, and, and traditionally a kind of economic regulator um, that's focused um, really on driving competition in the market, uh, and, and whether or not uh, the functions and powers that we have um, allow us to address some of the sorts of issues that you've described. So this was an issue that came up last week in the Westminster Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee, where our chair and chief exec were asked, "Do you need more powers? You know, for these for these sorts of these sorts of issues?" Um, we don't have a direct answer to it yet. I think some of the stuff that's coming uh, with the UK Digital Economy Bill um, is helpful for us to be able to, to drive change, um, but it is something that we're quite keen to keep an eye on. And if we feel that we need more power um, to address some of the challenges that you've suggested, then we're, we won't be shy in asking for it. Zoe. I think it's really important that we do something to address that level of inequality. And it may not be about home connectivity, it may be about using public services like schools and libraries um, and helping people engage with digital technologies. So I would say, in answer to your question, I think we should spend more time and put a bit more effort into that area of work. Presumably more money. Unfortunately, yes. always. <laughs> Stuart. I, I would just agree with what, what's been said already, and I, I think uh, it, it, digital participation does need continued funding. I think that as far as Science and Lands Enterprise are concerned, I think that our um, biggest area of focus would be the, the connectivity side to make sure that people have access to the ser uh, services. Um, but there will be um, other organisations that uh, will need to, to look at the digital participation issue. 
So, so can I just be clear? It would not be, you, you would not be worried if a poorer person in a village <coughs> did not have access, but all the richer people in the village did have access? No, 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 no that's not what I meant at all. I, 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 what I mean is that it's, uh, different agencies will do different parts of the jigsaw. It's absolutely important that everybody has, has, can get access. And I think uh, uh, to, to cover that situation, I think it would be uh, perhaps a better use of... of as, as Zoe said, libraries and, and public buildings to, to enable um, Wi-Fi access, for example. So can, I, can I just share, just one of the, the issue is certainly around the Highlands where it's more difficult. Nearly all the Highland Council buildings and the libraries have access to broadband. Um, and I know from personal experience of visiting them to, to do constituency surgeries, there is no public access to computers there. Would that be something that you would want to, to promote? We would certainly be behind the continued uh, focus on digital participation. The only point I was trying to make was that I didn't see it as one of HIE's um, core activities. We have uh, other parts of the jigsaw that we have to, to focus on. And, and what I was uh, meaning was that getting the services out into uh, the most rural parts was probably our primary um, uh, responsibility, as opposed to... Um, looking at Wi-Fi access. Stuart. Um, I think digital participation is a huge issue. issue. I would highly recommend the work the Carnegie Dr Trust has done looking at, at this particular uh, issue. I think we're, we're maybe one of the things that seems to be really improving digital participation is the, is the mobile phone and having more public services available, mobile friendly public services, digital government public services would be, would be a good way to go. Better digital public services generally would allow you to have more money to focus on those most in need. And I think that would be, a, you know, again, that comes back to what's the cost of not doing something about, about this. Um, just to touch on, on digital skills generally, there's been work by Skills Development Scotland looking at the, the digital skills of the, of the technology industry. But I think there's a wider bit of work required to look at um, the digital skills that the wider workforce will require now and in the future in terms of digital skills, which could be expanded to look at the digital skills that we, we expect of, the, of, of Scottish citizens. Okay, that which needs, leads neatly, if I may, onto the one question that wasn't asked, uh, which was on what the government needs to do to invest on m making up the skills sh shortage, certainly at school level and, and during the education process. And if you were able, post this meeting, to say where we think the, the government is on that and where they need to go on that, we would certainly welcome your responses on that in, in the written format because of the time I haven't been able to ask it. Is there anything that any one of you would like to say that you think we should have asked you and, and you want to give a specific point on um, or, or are you happy? I mean, Stuart is starting army left. You're, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, just... just Briefly touching on, on the, sk the skills point, money coming to Scotland from the apprenticeship levy, wouldn't it be great to use that as a focus, you know, di improving the country's digital skills with this money coming to, to Scotland? Approximate, from memory, uh, approximately 200 million yeah. uh, coming, coming to Scotland. Let's, let's pump it into di digital skills. Um, I think, d generally, generally speaking, in terms of the budget, what, we've, what we're trying to get, what we'd encourage the government to do is publish a list of the works they expect to be done every year so that businesses can make decisions on the basis of firm information about their, their infrastructure. Too, too many businesses simply don't know when their infrastructure is going to be improved. I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank, Thank you. you. Stuart. No, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the only thing I would add is to look beyond the 2020 target and to consider the budget over a longer period to get all the way to where we need to go. OK, Glenn. Um, yes, just one, one ask, if I may. Um, Ofcom published its draft annual plan yesterday, um, which we do annually for consultation, and that crosses our range of strategic priorities. Uh, and in line with the, the Smith Commission and Scotland Act provisions, we are consulting this committee, uh, other Scottish Parliament committees and the Scottish Government, and we would be very pleased if you could formally come back to that. We will certainly be looking at that. Uh, Michael. Thank you very much. I think I've had a chance to say quite a lot of what I wanted to say. 
On skills, I think we have, SCVO is doing a fantastic job addressing some of the skills gap in some of the most deprived areas of Scotland. That's one thing that's happening. But I think we have to look to the future and our education system is not yet digitally connected. We teach subjects without teaching how you use digital in those subjects. I'm not talking about teaching computer science now. I'm talking about how we teach every subject so that when people go into the workforce, they know how digital can affect what they're doing in whatever they're doing. So I think that's something that we should focus on through, from the teacher training colleges to, all the way through to the primary schools. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes our session. I, I'd like to thank you all uh, on behalf of the committee to come in. It, it, it's a huge subject. Uh, and, and obviously of huge importance to uh, Scotland and, and the budget that's going to be considered when it's published in uh, December. I, I would think on behalf of the committee, we, we, Glenn, we're looking for some uh, extra additional information from you and, and Zoe, we're looking for information from you. But I, I would ask all of the uh, witnesses if, if stuff you feel is important comes to your attention that the committee would welcome any input th that you would have and I, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd now like to suspend the meeting while we reorganize for the next witness. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, at agenda item three, the committee is going to take evidence on the draft Harbour Revision Order, to Aberdeen Harbour Revision Order 2016. I, I welcome Hamza Youssef, Minister of Transport in the Islands, Chris Wilcock, there you are, Head of Ports and Harbours, and Magdalene Boyd, so uh, who is a solicitor uh, from the Scottish Government. Uh, the instrument is laid under an affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve it before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider a motion to approve the instrument. Can I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement? Uh, good morning, uh, convener. Thank you, uh, convener. The expansion of Aberdeen Harbour is a nationally significant project as indicated by its inclusion in the third national planning framework. It will benefit the economy of both the North East and indeed of Scotland as a whole as the support for the oil and gas industry moves into a new phase in the North Sea. It will allow the harbour to expand out of its city centre constraints, provide uh, state-of-the-art uh, facilities to current and new market customers. Uh, Aberdeen Harbour Board plan to invest around £400 million uh, in the project. Our environmental advisors have considered the proposal in detail and concluded that with mitigation in place, there will not be a significant effect on the environment. Uh, I will uh, approve, of course, the construction environmental management document and documents which will ensure that mitigation uh, prior to, uh, to, to any work commencing. Uh, I'm aware that some local objections uh, remain, but I'm satisfied that the harbour are working with Aberdeen City Council to improve local amenities to compensate for any lost space, uh, loss of green space in Nig Bay uh, in their mitigation plan. The recently signed Aberdeen City deal will also support infrastructure improvements around the new harbour, although the full cost of the harbour construction will be met by the Harbour Board. I commend the draft order to you, Convener, and of course now ready to take any questions you or other members may have. Thank you very much. I think the first question is from John. Good morning, Minister. Minister, uh, my understanding is that there's planning permissions being granted for land work, land the landward side works, and this revision order is for the seaward part, to put it that way in, lay, in layman's terms. Is that correct? Um, there's some work... Uh, that is commencing in a round, but the, the, the main work that has to be conducted uh, cannot commence, uh, as you say, within the sea until I give approval as the minister to the construction and environmental management documents. That would be correct. And what's your view on the level of scrutiny that's afforded uh, this compared to the other works? Uh, well, I think the level of scrutiny uh, in terms of uh, the work that's going to be taking place in the sea uh, is, is great, actually. Uh, you know, the main objections that came from bodies like SNH, uh, even from the Council themselves, SEPA, other environmental organisations, and indeed individual uh, objectors were in and around the environmental impacts. Uh, and they uh, were towards a number of, of species, from salmon to bottlenose dolphins and, and many in between. Uh, and therefore, uh, the level of mitigation, the level of work, the level of scrutiny that is going into that piece of work, uh, I think, is, is vast, but it's important to be done to give the necessary reassurances. Indeed, you mentioned these organisations. If I, if I can um, talk about a letter that RSPB sent, and it included um, Marine Scotland and Transport Scotland um, within your particular remit, and it covered species, either Eider, Ducks, Tern, Kittiwakes, as you said, the... Um, Cetaceans, or dolphins, as you and I would call them, um, um, and also the Habitat Creation and Management Plant. Now, the, the environmental statement, you, uh, it seems to me that this has worked quite well. Would you confirm that there has been good engagement between the... Yes, I, mean, I think the engagement has been very positive, and that uh, you're right, the organisations that you mentioned, uh, many of them, uh, including the RSPB, initially put in objections. Um, colleagues in, in, in the government then worked closely with those organisations to ensure and to give the necessary reassurances that any mitigation that was put in place uh, would, 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 have, uh, would, would lessen the environmental impact. Um, those objections were then withdrawn after those reassurances. Now the real test, of course, will be the, the, the detail uh, in the construction and environmental uh, management documents if, uh, if the member uh, was to go to uh, uh, Article 29, I think it is Schedule 2, uh, Part D of the draft order. Uh, to make sure I'm not uh, giving you the wrong schedule, that uh, you know, they, 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 there's a number of plans, specific uh, plans that are, are required, uh, 13 of them in total, from marine mammal protection, 
uh, to, to, to you know, otter protection plans, to fish species protection plan, habitat uh, management plans. So, you know, a lot of detail going in to give reassurances, I hope, to organisations like the RSPB and, and SNH. Well, if I, if I may, clearly it has, because um, on the basis of these reassurances about mitigation, um, RSPB, for instance, withdrew their... Yeah. Uh, so, as a general principle, would you commend this approach to major developments? Yes, I think it's certainly one that, uh, in fact, one, one that, yes, I would commend to answer your question. I think it's fair to say we've also learned from previous um, examples and, and the previous infrastructure projects that have taken place um, where perhaps the level of engagement wasn't as thorough as this level of engagement has been. So we're always learning, and I think there's a good model there. It's not to say that everything has been ticked off. As I say, there's still some documents that we're, we're, I'm waiting for to see uh, before that work can absolutely be signed off. But most certainly, I think it's, uh, it's been a good level of engagement that should be replicated. OK, finally, Minister, if I may, you talked about the benefit to the economy um, and specifically mentioned oil and gas. Can you comment, and I appreciate it might be out with your remit, but can you comment on the potential that this would have for securing jobs in the renew renewable sector, sector and also decommissioning, which is going to be increasingly important? Yes, I mean, again, you're absolutely right. It would be a decision and a conversation that AHB, that the Harbour Board, uh, would more extensively uh, have. But certainly there's potential. You know, we, everybody here is aware, and members are aware of the difficulties and the challenges facing the North Sea uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, AHB uh, are looking to diversify, so decommissioning most certainly is part of their plans and part of the discussion, or servicing decommissioning I should say. Um, certainly looking at other business opportunities like uh, cruise vessels uh, as well, uh, which is important. Uh, there's absolutely no reason why they shouldn't be looking towards renewables. I'm sure that will be part of the plan. I couldn't comment directly and say it absolutely is, um, but uh, I'm certain any opportunities that diversify uh, while oil and gas will continue to be important, but diversify uh, the opportunity, uh, I think they will be looking at uh, and looking at very closely. OK, thank you very much, Nate. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you, Kimir. It's essentially a process point that I think it would be useful to get the Minister's uh, response on the record. Um, in the event that Parliament agrees this particular order, I take it the Minister can confirm that uh, various parts of government and officials will continue to have oversight uh, of uh, the, the, the project as it go forward, things like, for example, there are time constraints uh, on certain operations. And the Minister, in his contribution so far, has talked about documents that are still being waiting for that will need to be signed off. So it would just be helpful to know that this is not the end of the process as far as government is concerned. There will continue to be oversight and in extremis, the plug could subsequently be pulled on this, although I'm absolutely 99.9% .9 certain uh, we won't reach that particular point. Uh, yes, and I, and I think that's an important uh, point to make, particularly when there are so many environmental factors that have been considered, that have been questioned, uh, that have been asked that, yes, uh, on, on, on a project of this size and scale, although it is being funded by Aberdeen Harbour Board, it's not being government uh, funded, and we know there are trust port uh, that reinvest back any profits that are made into the harbours. Um, Although that's being said, the continual engagement, the oversight that, is, uh, uh, that, that, that has been mentioned in terms of the environmental documentation, yes, that will continue uh, and should continue. But I should say from the offset, the relationship has been very good and very positive, and the engagement has been very good and very positive. And going back to John Finney's point, uh, I think there's, uh, there's a good model there for others to, uh, to, to, to look at for future projects as well. Minister, could I just ask, uh, I, I was looking through the papers, to the, there were 21 local residents that were still objecting to this. Uh, could you give me a flavour of what those object, on what grounds those objections were? Because you seem to have solved, uh, I, I think it's seven of the 28 objections, but 21 remain. Yes, uh, convener, a lot of the objections did actually overlap and do still overlap with the environmental concerns. Um, now, as I've already mentioned, they're similar to the environmental concerns that were raised by organisations like SNH or RSPB. So I'm satisfied that the order should be laid, you know, because of the mitigation and the reassurances we've provided around environment. The other very strong theme that came from the objectors and remains from the objectors is the loss of the amenity, so the green space at, at, at Nig Bay. 
Um, I know AHB and, and Aberdeen uh, City, City Council are having discussions about how other local amenities can be improved. So St Fittix Park, which is nearby, how can improvements perhaps be made? Now, that's separate to any conversation government is involved in. Uh, I should say that's a separate discussion that will be taking place and is taking place between AHB and, um, uh, and the local council. Um, so those were the two, two, the two main themes, that, that the loss of the amenity in the green space, but also the environmental impacts. And I think we've gone as far as we possibly can to give those reassurances. I think given very strong reassurances uh, on that. And that's why I hope that the order will, will, will continue. Peter. Be moved. Thank uh, thanks, Convener. And, uh, welcome, Minister. I just, I just wonder, uh, environmental objections, there, there's, been, there's been a number. I just want to be sure that SNH, the, the, which is a you know, very important body, they are now content that the, the, all the, the issues that they had identified have now been, have now been uh, addressed and they are content that they, they, to carry on with this, this project. Uh, yes, I would uh, surmise by the fact that they objected and then withdrew their objection. Uh, and that's generally the process that we go through. Um, you know, the, the number of objections will come to a number of various infrastructure projects. What we then try to do is have that discussion with those organisations and learn from them. Look, what can we do to help to give you the reassurances you need? So, for example, when it comes to one of the main environmental issues, uh, it was around uh, the bottlenose uh, dolphins. Uh, and so the suggestion, well, what will happen now uh, as a result of, of, of the, the mitigation and the reassurances that we're giving, there'll be a, a rock armour place there. So any blasting work will be done behind that armour of, of, of rock, therefore mitigating the sound or the environmental impacts. Now, that comes from conversations with the likes of uh, SNH. So in particular, to, to, to your question, yes, uh, I, would, I would surmise that they're, they're satisfied by the fact that they've uh, withdrawn their objection. Um, uh, but we'll also wait to see what, what is in the construction environmental management documents uh, and ha that will hopefully give even further reassurances to organisations like SNH. Thank you. Thank you. Are mm. there any other questions? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the Minister and his officials, although they were there contributing for, but, but didn't say anything in supporting the Minister and for the evidence they've given. I'd like to move on to Agenda Item 4. Uh, which is the consideration of motion 02398 calling for the committee to recommend the approval of the draft Aberdeen Harbour Revision Order 2016. I would invite the Minister to speak uh, or, or just move the motion. To move the uh, motion and the order in my name. Do members have any further quest comments or questions? The question, therefore, is, is that motion 02398 in the name of Hamza Yusuf be approved? Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. Uh, that concludes consideration of this affirmative instrument and we will report the outcome of our consideration to the Parliament. I'd like to thank the Minister and his officials for giving evidence. That concludes this public part of the meeting today and I'll now suspend the meeting to allow the committee to move into private session. Thank you, Minister.